This is the BBC. For details of our complete range of programmes, go to bbcworldservice.com forward slash podcasts. Welcome to the latest global news, compiled in the early hours of Sunday, the 14th of January. I'm Oliver Conway with a selection of highlights from across the BBC World Service. Coming up, panic in Hawaii as residents are warned of an imminent missile attack. We got our children, put them in the bathtub, said our prayers. I was just sleeping. My friend just wake me up. He said, hey, let's go. There's a bomb coming to Hawaii. It turns out to be a false alarm. We hear what happened. Also in the podcast, tens of thousands of people in Austria protest against the inclusion of a far-right party in government. People have been shouting, uh, Nazis raus, Nazis out, uh, resistance, and saying that they represent the other Austria. One of the last rebel enclaves in Syria is hit by a reported chlorine gas attack. The South African president is booed by thousands of ANC supporters. And the BBC speaks to director Steven Spielberg about his latest film on a battle between a president and the media. The unavoidable uh, irony, uh, uh, which, which, is, which comes in the form of 1971 and 2017, and you just take the one of the seven, and you invert them, and you have a pendulum swing, which is as plain as the nose on my face. And, and, and that, that didn't escape any of us. More on that later. But first, Hawaii is thought to be well within range of North Korea's military. So there was understandable panic across the US island chain when text messages were sent out warning of an incoming ballistic missile attack. TV and radio broadcasts were interrupted with an automated Cold War style alert to stay indoors, move away from windows and lie down on the floor. It ended with the words, this is not a drill. Getting ready to go to the beach, I got a two-month-old and our family was together. When we got the alarm, we were actually terrified. We were on the 36th floor of our hotel and we didn't know what to do. I was just sleeping. My friend just wake me up. He said, hey, let's go. There's a bomb coming to Hawaii. I didn't talk you serious, but, you know, I just started running. We went to this other place, this a concrete building. That was the people who were just running on the street. They were all desperate. In the end, it turned out to be a false alarm. The Hawaii state governor, David Ige, apologized and said there'd be a full investigation. Early this morning, an error was made and a false alarm was sent um, to cell phones and to TV and radio. Um, we investigated and as soon as we became aware that it was an error, we uh, took action to uh, send the notification that it was a false alarm. You know, this uh, should not have happened. We are investigating the sequence of events that occurred. Uh, an error was made in um, emergency management, um, which allowed this um, false alarm to be sent. But Matt Lepresti of the Hawaiian House of Representatives was not impressed, saying his family had been terrified. We got our children, grabbed their emergency supplies, put them in our most enclosed room in, the, in our house, uh, which is our bathroom. We put them in the bathtub, said our prayers, mm -hmm. tried to find out what the hell was going on because we didn't hear any alarms, any of the sirens. And I'm very angry right now because it shouldn't be this easy to make such a big mistake. I asked our US correspondent David Willis what exactly went wrong. It appears to have been a simple human error. The governor of Hawaii coming out and saying that um, this was a mistake which occurred during a shift change. Three people off and three people on in that shift change and somebody simply pressed the wrong button. He said procedures will have to be looked at and they will make sure that this never happens again. It does seem strange that it's so easy to make a mistake like this. Extraordinary, isn't it? And uh, the panic it caused, quite considerable. Um, Hawaii is, of course, the closest U.S. state to North Korea, and uh, it has uh, its home to a large presence of U.S. military personnel as well. It's thought that any strike on Hawaii could cause considerable damage, not to mention thousands of deaths. And do people there take part in drills to prepare for this kind of thing? Well, it's interesting. This um, drill procedure was only put into practice at the end of last year. And so they've been looking into this. But these things are very much in their infancy in Hawaii. For example, there is no nuclear shelter in place there. There hasn't been one 
since the end of the Cold War. No buildings apparently are identified as shelters for people in Hawaii in this sort of circumstance. So if nothing else, that has revealed a major gap in the whole process. And I guess it'll be quite useful for the authorities to see exactly how people did react when this alert came out. Well, it will, yes. Uh, that is a, another a benefit to the whole thing. But uh, they will, frankly, Oliver, be very, very keen to put this behind them. It caused such alarm, as we've heard, and it's a terrible embarrassment there because it does raise the question, of course, of crying wolf. Will people actually believe it the next time, which may be the real time? Uh, that's just one of the concerns following this uh, unfortunate episode. David Willis in Washington. Earlier this week, the new far-right Austrian interior minister was accused of using Nazi terminology when talking about asylum seekers. Now at least 20,000 people have taken to the streets of the capital, Vienna, to protest against the presence of the far-right Freedom Party in the coalition government. Our Vienna correspondent Bethany Bell spoke to me from the rally. I'm standing in Hero Square, Heldenplatz, which is a huge square outside the former royal palace in Vienna. More and more people are coming in at the moment. Uh, it's a noisy, peaceful crowd. People have brought their children. I can see people with push chairs and uh, buggies. There was a group here called Grandmothers Against the Right. And people are, are shouting, listening to music and uh, protesting against the presence of the far right in government. Was this called following those controversial comments by the Interior Minister using the term concentrate about uh, asylum seekers, or was this already planned? This was already planned. There was a small demonstration uh, on the day that the government was sworn in, uh, around 5,000 people, bigger today, um, although not as big as demonstrations back in the year 2000 when uh, the far right uh, entered government back then. Um, this is a sign, though, the people here tell me of their concern about comments such as the one made by the interior minister saying he wanted to concentrate asylum seekers uh, into one place. People have been shouting uh, Nazis raus, Nazis out, uh, resistance, uh, and saying that they represent the other Austria. And does the fact that this protest is a lot smaller than the one in 2000, when I think there were something like 150,000 people on the streets, does that suggest that having the far right in government has now become sort of normalised in Austria? Well, the far right was in government, uh, but, you know, from 2000 for several years. Uh, it was then in opposition for quite a long time. Now it's back again. Um, Austria has certainly changed. Uh, the, the mood here shifted to the right, particularly after the migrant crisis of 2015 and 16, when many migrants came to Austria and through Austria. And Europe has changed as well. Um, back then, uh, the European Union imposed limited diplomatic sanctions on Austria. That hasn't happened now. There are many more far-right nationalist parties in Europe than they were back then. They have more positions of power. Um, so yes, there is a sense that things have changed, but uh, uh, from certainly it, it is the case that many Austrians are concerned about that. Uh, as I can see tonight, people have come out, uh, even in the rain, to demonstrate against the far-right, although in smaller numbers than back then. Bethany Bell in Vienna. Forces loyal to President Bashar al-Assad in Syria have been accused of a number of chemical weapons attacks in their efforts to recapture territory over the past six and a half years or so. One of the few large areas still in rebel hands is eastern Ghouta, on the outskirts of Damascus. It's under daily bombardment from the government forces which surround it. On Saturday, it reportedly suffered a chlorine gas attack. Local teacher Yusuf Ibrahim lives with his family in the town of Harasta, just outside eastern Ghouta. The inhabitants of the city are all underground, uh, living in the basement or cellars. For my family, the, uh, my son, you hear this uh, sound? It's an artillery shell which is uh, falling near here. And uh, the speakers in the minarets is saying now, attention, attention. War blends in the sky. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, is in Syria and spoke to me from Aleppo. 
We received reports this morning from Gucha. First, that their uh, residents had were smelling a very strong smell of chlorine in the area, and then doctors were reporting that people were arriving at local clinics with minor breathing problems, some irritation of the eye. There was a photograph that emerged on social media which showed a young boy who collapsed in the streets. All of these seem to be telltale signs of another chem um, chlorine gas attack in this case. Now, since then, the doctors have reported that there have been no deaths, a small number of injured, it seemed, and all patients have been discharged from hospital. So the attack, which seems to have taken place, if all the reports are to believe, seems to have been a minor one. Past attacks have, though, been strongly condemned. We even saw President Trump launching cruise missiles in a reprisal attack last year. Uh, are we likely to see any reaction this time? No, not at all, because the, the, those are on an entirely different scale. Our listeners may remember that it was also in this area, this rebel-held area of Ghouta, where one of the biggest poison gas attacks in August 2013 took place, with some 1,400 people killed, and a wave of sickening images of children writhing on the ground, the foam coming out of their mouths, uh, children in hospital, uh, people of all ages, uh, struggling, to, struggling to breathe, doctors struggling to cope. And that was said to be an incident where sarin gas uh, was used, not, not chlorine gas. And as you mentioned, the other was in April of uh, 2017 in Khan Sheikhoun in the northwest of Syria. A smaller number uh, of, of deaths, but that prompted the newly uh, inaugurated President Trump to launch a wave of missile strikes um, in Syria. This is by no means on the, it's, it's not on the scale same scale at all. There haven't been the same images. And this is sometimes the, the criticism that is made that time and there are these reports in rebel held areas of chlorine gas being used in small quantities such that they don't come, uh, they don't come onto the radar of the international community and there's no uh, real alert about them. But the Syrian government repeatedly denies that it is using chemical attacks. It still denies that it carried out either the major attack in 2013 or last year, although there have been UN reports uh, saying that the evidence collected seems to suggest it had to be uh, a, state, uh, a state institution with the, the weapons and the chemicals uh, capable of carrying out that attack on that kind of a scale. Although there have been reports that rebel groups, including so-called Islamic State, have also used chemicals. Our chief international correspondent, Lee Doucette, apologies for the distortion on the line, but we thought it was worth hearing from Syria. The South African president, Jacob Zuma, has been booed by his own party, the African National Congress. He was attending a party rally addressed by the new ANC leader, Cyril Ramaphosa. In his first major speech since he took over, Mr Ramaphosa acknowledged that the ANC has been beset by infighting and corruption and called for a change of culture, a thinly veiled attack on the man he's replacing. Our Africa editor, Fergal Keane, reports from the rally in the city of East London. <laughs> After years of corruption and bitter infighting, the songs of the liberation struggle in the mouths of the ANC grassroots sound like an admonishment to the party elite, a reminder of principles abandoned, promises betrayed. In his first major address to party and nation, Cyril Ramaphosa pledged to tackle the capture of state resources by a corrupt elite. We are going to confront corruption and state capture in all its forms and ramifications. We are resolute in our commitment to make this the year in which we build our movement and turn around the economy of South Africa. Among the listening crowds, there was an enthusiastic welcome for his message. He is promising about the job opportunities and everything, and we have trust in him. We still have trust in him. He has not broken that trust yet, so we have no reason not to trust him. And so two key messages emerged from Cyril Ramaphosa's speech. Party unity and the desire to root out corruption, but his challenge in this still divisive atmosphere is to make them compatible. If he can achieve this, he will be seen as a worthy inheritor of the legacy of Nelson Mandela. The prize is great, but the challenge immense. That report from South Africa by our Africa editor, Fergal Keane.
The Irish actor Liam Neeson has said that the sexual harassment scandal in Hollywood has sparked, quote, a bit of a witch hunt. His comments came after the veteran French actress Catherine Deneuve said men were being unfairly targeted and should be free to hit on women. Ian Palmer reports. Since the Harvey Weinstein scandal broke, prominent men such as the actor Kevin Spacey and the writer and broadcaster Garrison Keillor have been removed from their jobs because of accusations of inappropriate behaviour. And the effects of the scandal have been felt in other fields, including politics. At last week's Golden Globe Awards, actresses wore black on the red carpet to show their support for the Me Too campaign against sexual harassment. But some people have begun to voice concern about the current mood, including Woody Allen and the actress Kirstie Alley. Liam Neeson was asked on the Irish broadcaster RTE for his opinion about recent developments in Hollywood. There is a bit of a witch hunt happening too. In what sense? Uh, there's some famous people being suddenly accused of touching some girl's knee or something and suddenly they're being dropped from their program or something. When asked if he was on the fence about accusations made about Dustin Hoffman, Liam Neeson described it as childhood stuff. The concern he raised has not been universally welcomed. After this week's letter by 100 French women, Steven Spielberg said he didn't see the current change in attitudes as a witch hunt, but as an imperative. Ian Palmer reporting. The first panda cub to be born in France has been seen by the public. Only around a dozen countries outside China have pandas, so when there's a newborn, it's a great occasion, as Daniel Mann reports. Ever since the 1950s, when communist China gave pandas as diplomatic gifts to capitalist countries, zoos around the world have been eager to offer a home to the black and white bears. They're no longer classed as endangered, but encouraging giant pandas to breed is notoriously difficult, whether in the wild or in captivity. The animals are solitary creatures, and each spring males only have between one and three days to successfully mate. In 2012, after high-level negotiations between Paris and Beijing, a male and female arrived at Beauval Zoo in central France. So when a cub was brought before the public on Saturday, it didn't take very long for it to delight visitors. <laughs> Yuen Mong, which means making a dream come true in Mandarin, made its debut five months after it was born. Adoring crowds travelled from across France to see the panda alongside its mother. It was conceived through artificial insemination. Delphine Delors, whose mother founded Beauval Zoo, says it's a great achievement. We worked hand in hand with the Chengdu base to have this baby. It represents, above all, hope for the conservation of the species. I'm going to welcome the people who came, our visitors, our fans, and I'm going to introduce them to our adorable ball of fur, who's especially cute right now. It's a big moment. It's very moving. Nearly 10,000 kilometers away in Tokyo, another cub is proving so popular at Ueno Zoo that it's extending viewing times. From next month, Zhang Zhang, which the public has been able to view since December, can be seen for seven rather than two and a half hours a day. A quarter of a million people applied to see the first panda cub to be born at the zoo in almost 30 years. But the time visitors have to see Zhang Zhang will be very short, just two minutes. Daniel Mann. This is Global News, the most important stories and the best interviews and on-the-spot reporting from the BBC World Service. If you miss any of the week's main events, why not catch up with The World This Week, available to download from our website. Just months before Russia hosts the Football World Cup, one of its best-known teams has been criticised for a racist tweet. Campaigners said Spartak Moscow showed a shocking level of ignorance. With the details, our Europe regional editor Mike Sanders. The offending tweet, later deleted, showed Spartak Moscow's black players training in the heat of Dubai. The caption read, look how chocolate melts in the sun. It was posted with three laughing emojis by the club's Georgian defender, Georgi Jikia, who'd been asked to spice up the club's Twitter account. The campaign group Football Against Racism in Europe said it showed a shocking level of ignorance. Its monitor for Eastern Europe is Pavel Klemenko. What many in Russia are taking as a innocent banter shows the lack of awareness of the issues and ignorance 
the players and some of the population in Russia still have regarding the issues of race and racism in general. Anti-racism group Kick It Out said that with the World Cup only a few months away, it served as a reminder that Russia had significant work to do to eradicate racism of all forms from the game. Spartak Moscow has already been punished by European football's governing body UEFA for racist chanting during a youth team home game against Liverpool in September. It has also been sanctioned by the Russian authorities for Islamophobic chants. Since the latest tweet, the club has put out another, in which its Brazilian midfielder Fernando says there's no racism at Spartak. He calls the club a friendly family. Mike Sanders. North Korea surprised the world when it announced it wanted to send athletes to next month's Winter Olympics in the South. But there are plenty of logistical details to work out first, and some of them will be discussed on Monday. I heard what they are from our Asia-Pacific editor, Michael Bristow. There are numerous ones. First of all, um, the North and the South both have different ideas about what should happen if North Korea does take part uh, in the Winter Olympics. Um, so, for example, North Korea wants to take uh, uh, an art troupe as well as athletes, also cheerleaders, a taekwondo demonstration team, officials, journalists, and they've got to arrange for all those people to go. South Korea, uh, they want the North uh, Koreans to, to march with them at the opening ceremony. Seoul is also worried about possible contravention of UN sanctions which limit people's activity with North Korea. So, for example, um, it would be illegal for a ship to sail from North Korea to South Korea to bring this delegation to the Olympics. Also, there are restrictions on how much money um, South Korea can spend in order to... Uh, to, try to, to, to bring the North Koreans to South Korea and to accommodate w them once they are there. Uh, also, certain officials are blacklisted, so they won't be allowed in. So all these things have got to be sorted out before the North Koreans uh, can go to the Winter Olympics. And there's not that much time to, to sort these things out? No, February the 9th is when it starts, just a couple of weeks to go. And also, it's not just an arrangement between the North and South Koreans. The International Olympic Committee uh, have to get involved as well. And there's a meeting next Saturday um, to, to finalise uh, arrangements, if they can indeed be arranged. And all this, we remember, is just for two athletes, uh, two ice skaters from North Korea, they're the only ones who have qualified uh, or met the qualifying standard to take part in the Olympics. So an awful lot of negotiations for what, you know, in athletic terms is just a, a small reward. Yeah, there was some suggestion that some North Koreans might be able to take part as a wild card entry. Has that been followed up? There haven't been any reports of that that I've seen, but anything's possible. So, for example, the uh, deadline for registration for these Olympics uh, came and went in October, but still the International Olympic Committee are going to allow probably the North Koreans to go. So anything's possible, really. And this is just a sporting event, so an example of how difficult negotiations between the North and South can be. Exactly. You've got to remember that um, the reason people are going through all this effort to try and get the North Koreans to go to the Winter Olympics is because we've just had a year of really high tension, North Korea developing nuclear weapons, um, standoff with the United States, an exchange of insults, uh, and people worried about armed conflict. The idea is to get the North Koreans to the Olympics and then start talking uh, about other things. But just uh, as you suggested there, the, the, the range of things that they have to go through just to send a few athletes to South Korea to the Olympics suggests that nuclear negotiations are going to be far trickier. Michael Bristow. Is artificial intelligence up to thinking properly and intelligently about content and conversation? We hear a lot about the potential of this technology, but what are the boundaries? Our science correspondent Tom Fielden reports. During the past 13.8 billion years, our universe has not only transitioned from being very fiery and hot to being more cool, but it's more importantly, it transitioned from being really boring to being quite interesting, coming alive. The physicist and author of Life 3.0, Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence, Max Tegmar, gives us a very potted history of the universe. The first life I call 1.0 because it was really dumb stuff like bacteria that couldn't learn anything. The interest and, uh, starts to ramp up, though, he says, when higher order animals like humans, with the ability to rewrite their software, begin to emerge. I call us humans 2.0 because we can learn. And uh, it's this ability to upload our own software, which has enabled us to dominate this planet. Which brings us to life 3.0 
organisms that can reprogram their software by learning and redesign their hardware, their bodies, by manufacturing new parts. If life ever gets to 3.0... At this point, and, uh, Max Tegmark argues, all bets are off. It will be the ultimate liberation from our evolutionary shackles. The limits on what life can do are just awesomely far away from, from where we are. This, in a way, I think is an ancient fantasy. Of course, this is not Human life as you or I, or even Captain so Kirk would know it. Life 3.0 will boldly go far beyond biology. Professor Stephen Cave is the director of the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence at Cambridge University. So AI is giving a new way for us to think about that ancient dream of transcending the fragile body and living on in some kind of purer realm, some kind of you know, cyberspace as we think about it now. Hi, I'm Chris uh, Kachmatic. But getting to this brave new world sooner rather than later will require a step change in computing power. We are working on one particular device, and that is a memory for light. So that is a device that allows you to capture and then release these single particles of light. A step change that may be provided by quantum computing. Professor Ian Wormsley is director of the Quantum Information Technologies Hub at Oxford University. We're at the point where we understand what sort of machines we need to build and the major challenge at the moment is to deliver the engineering and some of the, the technical aspects that we need in order to actually make a functioning machine. And those are pretty fierce challenges, but we think we have a way to, to tackle them. Quantum computing really could be a breakthrough. Stephen Cave again. It really could enormously increase the speed at which uh, these algorithms can run. And if the data is available then for the algorithms to learn and if the algorithms are flexible enough and algorithms are also advancing extremely quickly, then quantum computing really could be a breakthrough in what AI can do. But that sets up a unique challenge for humanity. How will we stay in control when the machines we've built are so much cleverer than we are? And as Sandberg is from the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. The deep problem here is that intelligence, if we define that as the ability to solve a problem really well, is very disconnected from solving the right problem. So we really need to think about safety and how beneficial artificial intelligence is. But this is, of course, a tremendously deep problem. And typically, we don't know what wrong is until we see it. We do have to be very careful about the way in which we use these extremely powerful machines, particularly when what they're doing exceeds our own understanding. They may well produce results that are incredibly attractive to us, so minimizing accidents, better diagnoses, new drugs, and so forth. But if we don't understand the ways in which they are doing that, we will not be able to control them in the way that we are going to need to if we are going to live safely with intelligent machines in the century to come. And that report by Tom Fielden. The French president, Emmanuel Macron, has called for the traditional baguette to be included in the list of the world's most important cultural symbols. Last year, the UN cultural organisation UNESCO decided to add Neapolitan pizza to the list. And the French want to show that their bread is world class too. Hugh Schofield reports from Paris. No one knows who baked the first baguette. Was it for Napoleon's soldiers so that they could have a long loaf that was more easy to carry on a march? Was it a fancy comestible introduced a bit later from Vienna? Or was it labour laws of the 1920s that made it popular? Bakers then were banned from starting work before four in the morning. The baguette took less long to bake, so that became the staple. It may not actually be that old or that traditional, but today the baguette is the symbol par excellence of the French way of life. Indeed, it's one of those rare national symbols which actually conforms to the cliché. People really do walk about with breadsticks under their arms. And though there are plenty of cheaper ersatz versions of the baguette now available, everyone knows the real thing. Tasty, popular, culturally specific, under threat from low-quality globalised imitations, and now with the backing of the president. What better contender for world heritage status could there be than the crunchy, doughy perfection of la baguette francaise. Hugh Schofield.
Next to an American president at war with the press. No, not another story involving Donald Trump. One about one of his predecessors, Richard Nixon, and his 1971 battle with the newspapers. They had received leaks from the Pentagon Papers, the US government's top secret account of the Vietnam War. The documents revealed how successive administrations had lied about the conflict. Steven Spielberg's latest film, The Post, tells the story of how the Washington Post followed the New York Times in challenging the White House for the right to publish. James Nochte spoke to Steven Spielberg. We're talking here about a president and the press at war. Now, the circumstances were very, very different from today. The country had been riven by the war, families had been split asunder. It was a time of torment in America. Yes. But you see some kind of comparison, nonetheless, with the struggles that are going on around the White House today. What are they? The, the unavoidable uh, irony, uh, uh, which, which, is, which comes in the form of 1971 and 2017, and you just take the one of the seven, and you invert them, and you have a pendulum swing, which is as plain as the nose on my face. And, and, and that, that didn't escape any of us. What was then is currently now. It's very different, though. The, uh, the battles that the Trump administration is having with the media involve a media enterprise, a media world that is different, hugely different from the one that there was in 1971. You know, social media for a start and the president's own bully pulpit, his Twitter account. Well, because of social media and, and basically because there are many more sources and outlets for news reporting than ever before in history, uh, it was a lot simpler. We're approaching the anniversary of the uh, inauguration of Donald Trump. What lies ahead in the struggle between this administration and its critics? Well, what lies ahead is getting focused on the absolute objective truth in any issue, because the truth is what will save us. The misinformation, the disinformation, the, the, the accusation against, uh, you know, feeling attacked and then say your attackers or the facts they're presenting to us is fake, fake news, or as I believe as the White House invented, coined another term, alternative facts. Our country moving forward is going to depend on people believing that when they see a coffee table and someone else says it's a chair, they say, I'm seeing it with my own eyes. That is a coffee table. Steven Spielberg talking to James Nochte. And that's all from us for now, but an updated version of the Global News podcast will be available to download later. I'm Oliver Conway. Until next time, goodbye.